Hey everyone, I'm Sam Valenti. Welcome to another episode of Backlot Pass. Today, I have the great, great honor of being joined by a wonderful actor and animal activist. She played Jill Bennett on Knott's Landing, and you also might know her from her memorable guest appearances on Seinfeld. She's also the president of the Amanda Foundation, which is the only nonprofit animal charity in the LA area to own and operate a full service vet practice, the great Terry Austin. Terry, like I said earlier, such an honor to be speaking with you today. Well, I'm very happy to be speaking with you too, Sam. Yeah, so let's get into your background here a bit. Uh, you grew up in Toronto, home of the Maple Leafs. Uh, what are your fondest memories of growing up in Toronto? Uh, I love my hometown. Um, I didn't leave Toronto because I didn't love it. I left it because I had a job opportunity in Los Angeles. So I went to pursue that. But, um, you know, Toronto is a fabulous city. It's a very multicultural city and um, it's surrounded. You know, you don't have to uh, go very far outside of Toronto before you're in beautiful farmland and then in lakes and and uh, lots of trees and and I have so many fond memories of Toronto, both the city itself, it's a bustling city, it's 4 million people, and wonderful restaurants and excellent live music scene, lots of theater. Um, people like going out in all the seasons, so there's always something to do. And um, it's just really a friendly city, still in 2023, it's still a really friendly city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did, did you go to a lot of Leafs games growing up? Why, yes, Sam, I did. <laughs> And um, yeah, going to see the Maple Leafs is a rite of passage. And uh, when I was first started going, um, the um, arena was had you know had wooden fold up seats and stuff like that. And it was uh, it was really uh, 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 you know a, a lot of history in that in that arena. So um, yes, but I grew up going to the hockey game first with my family, and then you know on dates when you got older, and then. Uh, when my, my just recently, well, not that recently, just a couple of years ago, it was right before COVID. It was li literally the week before the whole country shut down in March 2020. My uh, two brothers and my sister came down to visit me in Los Angeles. And we were so fortunate that that week there was a King's Leaf game. So mm. we got to root for our Maple Leafs here in LA. So that was really special. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, you know, it's great. The Maple Leafs, they finally they were finally able to get past the first round for the first time in forever. I know, but you know, those of us who have lived and loved the Leafs for many years, um, always kind of hold our breath and we root for them and we wish and we pray and you know, that they, they go forward. But if that does not happen, I cannot say that it is a new experience for us, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so we just, you know, the, the phrase in Toronto is that, well, there's always next year. So, yep, exactly. Well, well, hey, and then, then, hey, you know what? At least Toronto had the Raptors win the championship a couple of years back. So you got that. No, it's a great sports town, actually. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, of, you know, four season sports that can be done in Toronto and, and people are big sports fans. So it's another thing that people get together for. And it's really enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, and I've been to Toronto before. It's such such an amazing city and just so much great culture there. There's so much going on. It's just, you know, it's really great. Like this whole big mashup. Now, Sam, did you go in the summer? Uh, Yes. Yes. Because you're from Arizona. So you were not going to go in December, were you? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so, no, so no, yeah. Uh, so let's, so how did you kind of, you know, get interested in acting like, like, like at what point, you know, did, did, did you realize I want to become an actor? Pretty young when I was a little kid, like, you know, five, six years old, and I was watching old black and white movies on television, I discovered Shirley Temple. And Shirley Temple sang and danced and she was cute. And everyone loved Shirley Temple. And I thought, well, I want to be her. Cause that, that looks like a very nice life. So I used to watch those movies and copy her dances and then, you know, perform them in my uh, family's home. And um, 
just was a little, I, mean, I was a little ham and then I grew up to be a big ham. And so I always wanted to be on stage. I always loved acting. So I got involved very young in, in um, things that were going on at the library or in my school. And, um, and then I did uh, do a bachelor of fine arts in theater performance at York university in Toronto. So I, you know, I, and I always tell people when people say, you know, how can I get into acting? I say, you know, if you love it, start doing it. Start doing it at whatever level you can. You know, there's always lots of opportunity to get on stage in any village, town, or city. And uh, and that's what I did. And then when I got older, I started auditioning. Um, when I was about 15, 16 years old, I started auditioning in Toronto. And Toronto has always had a, a very bustling uh, theater community. And then in the 70s and 80s, uh, film and television really took off. So I was doing... Oh <laughs> and so uh, that that was my start with um, uh, you know in Toronto and, and auditioning for things and and working on uh, television film and on stage in Toronto. And then I I met an American producer in Toronto who I was who was shooting a movie during the summer on his hiatus, and uh, it turned out he was the uh, producer and creator of Knots Landing and of Dallas, and he said to me, you know you do really well in Los Angeles. So I came down to Los Angeles and I went to lunch with uh, David Jacobs was his name. He just recently passed. Lovely man, just such a decent person and such a wonderful writer and creator. And we went to lunch and uh, he said, you know, I had a, a one scene in, a, in next week's episode. I was going to cast it this afternoon, but if you're in town and you want to do it, do you know, do you want to do one scene in Knott's Landing? And I said, sure. And so I came in uh, two days later and did this one scene in Knott's Landing. And then I went home to Toronto. I was shooting a show in Toronto. And uh, David called me after a few months and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, my show wrapped. And he said, well, CBS likes you. Do you want to join the cast of CB or Knott's Landing? And so that's how I ended up on Knott's Landing. Wow. And then the, then the rest was history, right? Yeah, and then when I finished with Knott's Landing, I always enjoyed comedy, and I did a lot of comedy, so that's when I started doing all those, you know, those half-hour comedy shows, and I did two of the first six original Seinfelds, and so that was that was fun and historic. And was yeah, great. yes, absolutely. So, 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 you, so you mentioned kind of earlier, you mentioned that you, you attended York University in Toronto, uh, so, you know, and I'm in college too right now, so, so I'm kind of, you know, so I'm very curious, just kind of what was your experience like there you know what are your favorite memories from university life well you know I loved it because when I was in grade school and high school and I was or like I said I was always interested in being on stage and you know not everybody wants to be on stage and a lot of people are timid or they don't see the attraction in that and I would write plays and then go to my my friends in school and say hey I want you to be my play and they'd go I don't want to be in your play I don't want to be in any and I say, but it's a big part. It's got lots of lines. They go, again, I don't want to be in your play. <laughs> so it was hard for me to understand people who didn't want to perform. And then when I got to York, it was all people who wanted to perform. So I kind of found my tribe, you know, and it was wonderful because uh, it was a conservatory course and we studied everything from fencing to voice to stagecraft to, you know, we learned, um, even though we were actors, we learned about props, we learned about lighting, we learned about costuming, we learned all kinds of dance, uh, we learned all different methods of, of preparing. And it was wonderful. And it was a four year um, concentrated course. And, and I have many fond memories, made wonderful friends who I, I still have today. And uh, that's a great thing about Toronto. I mean, I still have friends I went to kindergarten, with, you know, um, but York University was great. I had wonderful, I, I think it really prepared me very well to go out and actually, uh, professional um i had done some professional work before i came to york but um that was it gave me a really good center and a really good core to draw from and made me realize um how varied my performance could be because as you know especially in television and film you tend to get typecast and so if you've not had any conservatory training then you might think that's all you can do and that's your thing but really if you're allowed to and you're given the tools you can you can be anything you can be Juliet or you can be the nurse you know yeah absolutely and, and you know I, I really li like hearing about it how you were saying how how once you got to York you were able you were able to find people you know who wanted to do the same thing yeah. that you were and I can really relate to that because you know when I was in high school and stuff I've always wanted to go into broadcast and stuff but 
but, but, but it was like, like I had like no friends who wanted to go in a broadcast, you know, like in high school growing up. But then I come to college, I go to broadcasting school, and then we all want to go into broadcasting and stuff. And we're able to kind of bond over that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And when you have an appreciation for something, like when I was about 12, um, I was, I love radio drama. I always loved radio. So it's so creative and it just calls on all of your, your imagination. And in Canada, we have the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, which is a government um, station and does everything. So when you listen to CBC radio, you there's wonderful programs like informational programs or drama programs. But then I used to love listening to the farm report, which used to come on at like right before lunch. And they would talk about the pigs and little ones and they talk about, you know, what was selling and the futures and grain. And so it was just interesting because it was a slice of life that I wasn't living. I was a city girl, right? So um, I, uh, I love all the, the variety that you get. And so when I, when I was 12, I had a, my, we had a family friend um, who was work, who had a radio show, a very popular morning radio show in Toronto. And it started, um, they, I mean, they got the, they started at 5 a.m. It was like five to eight right before, like, you know, that, that time slot there. Watching how a radio show call comes together, the technology and, and, you know, how everything is coordinated. And now there's so many people behind the scenes. I was just blown away by it. And so I, I love all aspects of, um, you know, radio, television, film. It's all, it's all fascinating to me. Yeah, absolutely. I 100, 100% agree with you there. Um, so, so, so now, now, now I kind of want to mention this. You were talking about, about how, how you got into Nod's Landing and people still remember you from that yeah. role, even today, today. I mean, I mean it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. a popular show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so. it's, you know, it's cool because it was, you know, that show was a spinoff of Dallas. And, you ah, know, I will tell you a secret. Only you, Sam, may know this in your, in your group. But actually, David Jacobs wrote Knott's Landing first. And mm. Knott's Landing was about a bunch of not neighbors who lived on a cul-de-sac. And he tried to sell that to CBS. And they went, nah, it just seems kind of, boring. like, yeah, it's kind of ordinary. Not really that, you know, whatever. And, um. So he came back to them with Dallas, which was about a big rich family, you know, and all the drama and everything. And they bought that. And it was so successful. Dallas was so successful that the studio, the network said, what was that other show you had for us? <laughs> and so actually, Knott's Landing was written first, but Dallas was produced first. And it was because of Dallas that Knott's Landing actually, you know, became a thing as well. Wow. How about that? I did not know that. That's so crazy. Wow. Yeah, David was an excellent writer. He he wrote a lot of shows. He wrote Family, he created and wrote Family, and I don't I can't remember all of them right now. But um, he was a big fan of the um, the fast talking uh, Spencer Tracy, Rosalind Russell sort of uh, Cary Grant movies of that era of the 30s and 40s, and uh, and so he liked he liked crisp dialogue, and, and he was a a really nice man. Really, really good, good, good producer, good writer, really nice person. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because now I was actually born and raised in Dallas. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so even growing up and inside, I, th I think, you know, even no matter what age you are, you know, you grow up in Dallas, you know about the show and you uh, know about Larry Hagman is GR is GR Ewing. You know, you know all about that stuff. So, yeah, I always. I kind of always have that as, as a little badge of honor, like, wow, my city had to do, had its own show. That's right. So the uh, um and the great but the great thing about you know your not slanting role is that it was so you know popular at the time. It was this great performance you had. You got to be featured on the cover of TV Guide, which is so awesome. Yes, I you know I'll I'll tell you something else about that. Um, okay, so being from Toronto, we had a TV Guide. Um, and it wasn't the same company. I don't know if it was the same company that produced it, but it was like the size of a comic book. You know, it was kind of a bigger format, right? And so I hadn't been in Los Angeles very long. I had been here less than a year. And my agent called me and said, oh, TV Guide wants to do um, a shoot with you. And they're considering the cover. They don't tell you right away. They pick it later. You know, sometimes they don't end up using it. So um, I went and I did the <laughs> I went and I did the photo shoot. And um, and then, you know, several weeks later, 
I got a call and my agent said, oh, you, you've got the cover of this and, I, and, I, and it's coming out next week or whatever. So I was all excited and I went to pick it up. And you know, the TV guide format, it's a, it's a small, it was a small, they don't make it anymore, I don't think, but it was small. It wasn't, a, it was like, you know, it was like eight inches. It was like a little book, right? It wasn't like a, the bigger format. And I was actually disappointed when I saw it because it was kind of puny and I was expecting a great thing, <laughs> like a regular magazine format. So, but it was very nice. Um, and it was, uh, it was a big deal at the time. And, at, you know, at the time, that TV guy, because you're talking, this is before the internet, because that's how old I am, Sam, uh, that TV Guide was the number one magazine in all of the United States. There were more copies of that sold every week than anything else. So yeah, it was a big deal. It was fun. Wow, wow, that is awesome. Yeah, it's it's so cool. Like 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 do do you have like that? Do you have like that that magazine cover like like framed somewhere? You know, in the garage. I'm not one of those people who puts pictures on the wall. I don't know why I've never been that way. So in my garage, there are there is you know when when the good Lord calls me home, Sam, someone's going to go into my garage and find a million pictures of me. Um, but. The TV Guide people were very nice because they did send you a beautifully mounted, like, you know, professionally mounted behind glass, uh, big format picture. So even though the actual magazine was, a, they sent me a great big picture <laughs> and it was very nice. So. Wow, yeah. that's that, that's great. Um, and I, it's funny. I was actually able to find an excerpt from the article and it's in the magazine. Oh, yeah. Um, and, it, and, and apparently you mentioned that you were really good at pool. Which I thought, which I thought was interesting. At the time, yeah, I, I don't play anymore. But um, I grew up. My parents. We had a very nice slate bottom Brunswick table in our house that my father had um, rescued from a old pool hall that was closing down. And when we got that table, it was fifty years old or whatever. And we all learned to play pool on it. My mother shot pool. My dad shot pool. And um, it was a family, you know, something. Used to do on Sundays or in the evenings is uh, shoot pool together, and we all got pretty good at it for a while. Um, as I say, since I've moved down to the United States, I didn't find as many people who um, who played pool. But in Toronto, there's lots of pool halls and and nice you know places to go that families can go. It's it, it, you know, and so it was. It's a popular sport in Toronto. We play snooker, and um, but I just uh, haven't had the opportunity living down here to find a group of people who want to shoot pool but if i ever meet you in person sam you know play 10 bucks a ball hey absolutely i would definitely be down for that yeah because i i had like never really played pool before but then oh, this last bucks a ball, then. yeah so, so it's interesting so so like just over this summer just this past summer i really got into it because i was playing pool oh. with a friend and yeah it's kinda, fun yeah it's now a, i'm like you obsessed. play all your life you know so yeah. are, you, are you continuing to play? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's just I, I just have so much fun with it. It's, it's just a fun game to play, you know, especially with other people, you know. Well, it's a nice thing that, you know, the nice thing about that particular game is it is played all over the world. And um, and it's, it's a nice game because you can socialize with it. You can talk while you play, you know, so it's not something that a lot of games that you play with people. Um, you're on one side of a fence or a net or you're running down the, down a field or a court or something like that. And there's really not a lot of conversation. But the nice thing about pool is that it's very social and, it, and it's multi-generational. You know, you don't have to be a certain age or whatever to play pool. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every, everyone of, of any age can enjoy it. So yeah. and um, it's an interesting game because it has to do with physics. You know, uh, that's what I find. I, and I stunk at math, so I, not that I'm a brainiac when it comes to math, but I always just found the, uh, you know, how the balls d deflect and, you know, the the velocity of that you're hitting one ball to hit another to, you know, to bank or whatever. It's just interesting. It, it, yes, it sure is. And and, and listen, d don't worry about not being good at math. I, I've never been good at it either. I was, I'm just terrible. It's so, so I can relate to you there. It hasn't held me back so far, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now I want to talk talk about about some of these, you know, other roles they've been in, and, and maybe I'm not sure if you've ever really talked too much about some of these roles. Um, sure. But in in '86, you appeared in, in this movie called The Vindicator, uh, a film that took heavy inspiration from The Terminator. Let's just say that. Oh, let me tell you something, sir. We were first. The really? Terminator after us. 
And the interesting thing is, is that we had the same special effects guy, Stan was Stan's last name. We had the same special effects guy. And it was interesting because they Terminator stole a lot from uh, Robocop. Right. And that was out first. So. Really? Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And like I say, it was the same special effects guy. So it wasn't that they stole it. It was like that, that movie came out. I mean, you know, they, you, you often say in movies and television and stage, there's, you know, there's no new stories, you know, boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. I mean, like, you know, there's really no new stories. It's just how we tell stories. Right. And, um, and so the Robocop, I, it wasn't a matter of stealing it. That just happened to come out first. And as I said, the gentleman who did the special effects, who created the the robot head and everything like that, and the and the suit and everything. I think a year and a half later, um, when they did RoboCop, I'm sure he brought a lot of that expertise to that film. But um, and they had a huge budget. I mean, this was my ours was a Canadian movie in 1986. We had like a dollar ninety eight budget, and they had like you know zillions of dollars. But I'll tell you something funny too is that you know nowadays. <laughs> When they do special effects, you know, CGI is so, I mean, you can do anything, right? Against a green screen, you can create a city, you can do anything. But back in 1986, uh, because it was a low budget movie, we had two of the heads for the RoboCop creature, right? Like the, and there was one suit, but there were two crews. There was an A crew and a B crew. And the B crew is shooting like reaction shots and people getting out of cars and stuff like that. So I'll never forget the one thing we had to do reaction. They had to do pit, what they call pick up shots when they, you know, when they look at, at the dailies at the time for the movie and they say, oh, you know, we, we need another shot here and we need this one now. So they send the, the, the second uh, unit out to do pick up shots, right? So there was a, there was a few scenes because it was a scary movie. It was There were a few scenes where the RoboCop guy would be after me, right? And I, and I was the ingenue or the, you know, the damsel in distress. And so my job was to scream very prettily and uh, look terrified. And um, the funny thing was, is that when we shot these things, the animated head with the suit was out with the A crew and the pickup crew. All we had was the non-animated um, head, which they then would put on a broomstick and then just wave it up and down off camera so that I could have an eye line and react to something. So my fabulous acting was in fact, not because another actor was feeding me something, but I was looking at a mannequin head on a broom pole off camera. <laughs> wow, how, wow. how about that? Huh? <laughs> yep, just, just pure movie magic, right? Oh, I laughed okay. thinking about it because it was pretty funny at the time too. So. Oh my gosh! Um, you, but but seriously, you know what I like about that movie is 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 I really like like how how you kind of, you know in that movie you're kind of carrying the you're kind of carrying the the emotional side of the movie you know kind of more of those emotional scenes and stuff and that's a, that's a really adds to the movie it's like in the midst of all the goofiness and stuff stuff you know you know you know you're there you know to to kind of bring in the emotion and really you know kind of add the tension to the movie which it. You know, you do a great job of that. So thank you. It was fun. Pam Greer was in that movie. And I was already yes, yes. Pam and Furs from you know other things. And um yeah. Lots of people came through Toronto to shoot films and and uh I had a, a wonderful time. I've had a blessed life. Yeah, absolutely. And then and then of course, you know, a lot of people know you from Knots Landing, that being a big show, but you know, there's another show that, that you were on, uh, this uh, funny show on ABC with the uh, singing police officers. Opera. Oh, my yep. God. So much fun. That was like the most fun job I've ever had. It was all people who were, yeah, like you know, they call it triple threat. You know, you sing, you dance, you act, right? Mm -hmm. And and so some people were more dancers and they were actors or singers and some people were singers more than they were dancers and actors. And I'm I'm an actor and I can sing, but I wasn't like Kathleen Wilholt was on that show and oh my God, what a voice, you know, oh, so many people, so many talented voices. But you did have to sing to get the job. And so, you know, that that was part of my audition and I got hired. And that show uh, was done by um, Stephen Bochco, who was writing high with Hill Street Blues and LA, all these shows, right? And so um, he was the guy in, in uh, Hollywood at the time for doing those, you know, one hour dramas. And so he had a deal with ABC to do a number 
of shows. And Cop Rock was one of them. And that was the one he was working on at that time. And it was his idea to do this, this singing musical or drama. And um, so he's music. Hey, hey. And, um, and so we did it. And um, let's just say to most people, this was not the most successful show that we see it ever done. So instead of doing the full commitment of 12, which this, this, the network had bought for him, like they committed to 12 episodes, at episode nine, they decided to pull the plug. It was the most expensive show ever produced at the time because the hours were forever. Imagine you have all those dance numbers to rehearse and singing numbers to rehearse. And then the, and then you had a big cast and multiple sets. It was a very expensive show. So it took a lot of rehearsal and uh, and it just wasn't paying off in uh, viewership. So, you know, uh, so Stephen had a, a meeting, you know, and he said to everyone, he said, well, we're not going to do 12. We're going to, this is to be the last episode. And I was supposed to sing in the next episode after that. So I said, I said, Stephen, the show didn't get canceled because I knew I was singing. <laughs> he said, no, no, it wasn't your fault. Yeah. But, which was just a joke. But it was one of my favorite shows of all time. There were so many talented people. It was so much fun to do. It was like being in a Broadway musical. And uh, I have nothing but uh, it. And I, I know when you if you talk to other people who are on that show, Everybody says the same thing. Because they do limited series in, in England and in France and Germany. They don't always do shows that are meant to go for years and years and years. So I was doing this movie. shoot. It was shooting in Geneva. And it was a co-production. It was a French-Canadian uh, um, co-production. And I was doing a, 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 a press lunch. And one of the people asked me about cop rock. And I thought, oh, they're going to say something terrible about it. Because the critics in the United States were not kind about that show. Like, is it horrible? They said, it's stunk. So I, this guy said, excuse me, so I want to ask you about cough rock. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be, he's going to say something, you know, terrible. And I said, I said, oh, yes. I said, you know, what did you think? And he said, I loved it, Mademoiselle. I was in Geneva. It's a French part of Switzerland. He said, oh, Mademoiselle, it was fun because I loved it so much. And I said, Yes, me too. <laughs> so I skated past any sort of criticism, but it was very popular in Europe. You know, so that was great, but I loved it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's you know, it's it's a really fun show. You know, and I can just I mean, I mean, and just like you've been saying, I can only imagine how much fun it was to film and do all like the dancing, singing. Just like every time I watch the show, it just looks like all you guys are just having a blast. Yeah, and I I. Like I said, I wasn't the dancer or singer, so I didn't get to do a lot of that. Just but be like, but being I was in scenes where that was going on, and um, and and you know what? I'll tell you, the actors on that show, which was such long hours, loved it so much. People came in on their days off to watch other people shoot their scenes because they were that fabulous, you know. And when you look at the the songwriters for that, they were big time songwriters, you know. So yeah, it was great. I've been yeah. Lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's interesting because because I know you mentioned Kathleen Will Hoyt earlier and she, you know, she actually was a guest on the show like very recently. So I'm a huge fan of hers in the pilot episode. If you go back and watch Cop Rock, I'm such a huge Kathleen Will Hoyt fan. If you in the pilot episode, it ends with her sitting on a park bench singing a song. And if you can not if you watch that song and you don't cry, your heart's missing. It'll just her voice is spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the great thing about Kathleen. You know, not only a great actor, but but an amazing singer as well. And she she's had a couple albums as well, so she's yep. fantastic. I totally agree. Um, and, and now, like you mentioned, like we were talking about earlier, you know, you've you know you've had some memorable guest roles on some of these, you know, half hour sitcoms over the years, right? Yeah. So stuff like Seinfeld. I know you. I know you've done some podcasts specifically about Seinfeld, which is awesome really gone into detail about, you know, of course, your appearances on there. Uh, so the guest roles that I kind of want to bring up, you know, maybe maybe some that maybe, you know, know you haven't, uh, you know, really talked about much. Uh, one is Free Spirit, the show show with, show with like this this witch uh, character, and, and you come in as, as like this very high class lady and stuff, and you're kind of kind of trying to kind of trying to seduce the dad character in the show. It's it's mm -hmm. really fun and, I, and that, that's one of my favorite performances of yours well thank you you know it's kind of a, a takeoff on a Noel Howard play called Vice Spirit, Vice Spirit 
And um, yeah, it was very fun to do. And, and that's the great thing uh, about half hour comedy is that there's, I mean, you, it is like a one, it's like it's very short three act play, you know? And I think the best example of that, which I was never on, but I'm such a fan of and watch the reruns of now is Frasier. I mean, in that half hour, it's three specific acts, you know, and a good sitcom is like that. And that's what's fun about sitcom. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I just think, you know, you know, too, too, it's I, I kind of think that, that especially, you know, the multi-cam sitcoms, you know, in front of a live audience, you know, in a way it's almost like kind of shooting a, a theater performance, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely it is. And and yeah, there's a lot of energy that comes from uh, an audience, and that's why they do it, because it's much funnier in front of an audience. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And then there was a th there's another Canadian show that, that you were on. It, it, it was kind of it was not your standard sitcom uh, that you had a guest role on. It's this show called Maniac Mansion. And it was oh, yeah. it's based on a video game. And I'm just wondering if you have any uh, specific memories of uh, that. You show. know, the, the, the people on that show, a lot of them are the people who did um, Second City TV. Hmm. The writers and the producers and the actors, you know, if you look at the cast list for that. Um, and so, yes, it was based on a, a game show, but the the genius of that show and the humor of that show is very much the uh, Second City Toronto uh, family. You know, Chicago has Second City and Toronto had Second City and then Toronto had a Second City TV show. And that was, you know, uh, that was Catherine O'Hara. And, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget everyone's name, Ju Eugene Levy and Andrea Martin. I mean, that was the TV show that was out of Toronto, which I also did a little bit parts on. I was, uh, you know, I, I was, I can't tell you what a thrill it was to watch Catherine O'Hara perform. I mean, wow. So that was worth the price of admission to be on that set. But um, yeah, so uh, Maniac Mansion was very much fun, very zany and, and everything. But that a lot of uh, the people there, like I said, uh, same people who did Second City. Wow! 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 That that is that's so cool. There's uh, there there's there, that's a lot of that is a lot of amazing amazing talent, right? In a, oh. in a good show. Great, like everyone on that show, on the Second City show was was just brilliant, and the Maniac Mansion too. Like I say, they're just really clever and well put together, and and yes, yeah, so just was very much fun to do. Yeah, absolutely. But, 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 you know, you're, you're mentioning all these people that you got to work with, you know, I, I think that all these people, you know, no, 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 should be very lucky to say that they worked with Terry Austin. So. Oh, you know, like when I, when I'm second city, I had little tiny parts. I was a teenager at the time, but, um, but like I say, you learn from everybody. That is the, when you get to be on sets with people who are farther in their careers than you and better than you, you know, that's how you, um, that's how you grow and getting the opportunity to, to do that. I mean, I, I am forever grateful. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You, you know, that, that's such a, you know, that's such an important way to get experience and stuff. And, you know, you know, and I can relate, really relate to that kind of with, my broadcasting professors here at college and stuff, you, you know, just, just taking any bit of wisdom, you know, I can, I can get and stuff so I can a hundred percent relate there. You know, on, on the second city TV, I remember one time I was in the scene and um, uh, John Candy was being the Schmangi brothers. I can think about that today and I'll just fall over laughing. It's just the funniest thing in the world. So. He, he, oh, he, you know, John Candy, you know, one of my, one of the all time greats. Yeah. One of my one of my all time favorites too. Very nice person too. Yes, a hundred percent. Now I got to mention this uh, this other little movie you did. It's kind of a fun little fantasy film called The Lord Protector, and I I oh, really I love, love, love it, love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what's fun? The best about that um, is that the producer um, was very much a big fan of that genre of fantasy like Lord of the Rings and all of that as it was I you know I read those books three times each when I was in high school and um, he wanted to do it um, as well as possible and he didn't have a great but a great big budget but he very much understood and had participated himself with fencing and sword play and he hired a phenomenal teacher 
And he did something pretty unheard of for a small budget movie was for weeks. And I can't remember if it was like six or eight weeks. We did hardcore uh, saber and uh, saber dagger and foil um, training. Mm. And I had studied this. Like I said, when I went to York, we got all of that um, in university, which was great. But I hadn't done it in a long time. And uh, oh, that was so much fun, uh, you know, getting to the, the costumes and then getting to do sword fights. And he was also in that movie, and that's a while ago. And I didn't, wasn't just the damsel in distress. I also got to participate in the sword fight. So that was great. Oh, that was so much fun. It was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, no, and, and you mentioned, you know, getting to be a part of the part of like, like the fighting scenes and stuff. And I, and I yeah. thought that was awesome that, that you got to take part in that, you know, and, and you and you weren't just, like you said, you weren't just the damsel in distress. You got to actually be a part of the action as well. Yeah, yeah. no, that was great. I've had so many great jobs that I, um, you know, when I when I stopped, sometimes I forgot, like I hadn't thought about lower checks for a long time, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great deal of fun and, and to this day, if you toss me a foil, I can at least take the pose. You know, I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could win a fight, but <laughs> I could look like I could. I could act like I could. Yeah, and 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 I just want want to say that 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 you've just been in so many different projects, you know, over the years, you know, where it's TV shows, movies, you know, whatever. And and I think the thing that always sticks out to me is you always leave an impression, no matter how big a role is or how small it is. You always leave an impression in every role you every role you have. Well, that's very kind of you, Sam. And it's what every actor hopes to hear. So thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much. That's a nice thing I've been, I have had an opportunity to do a lot of different things. Um, I used to say to my agent that there were three reasons I would take a job. One was it was a fabulous part. I didn't care what I made. I was going to have a wonderful time doing it would learn and work with great people. The second was is that um, it was going to pay a lot of money and wouldn't embarrass me. Kind of joking about that. But uh, but the, the other, the other uh, thing is, is that I, always, I love to travel and I love to live other places. So I was always very interested in jobs that were working in other countries because visiting a country is very different than living and working with people who also live there. You really get much more of a flavor of that place and I was able to like you know I said I worked in Geneva and I, I lived in Paris for a year shooting a Stephen Cannell show which was amazing and because I was there for a year I got to travel a lot through Europe I worked in New Zealand uh, with Mickey Rooney um, you know and different places that I've been able to go uh, and and live not just visit uh, that I mean that's a that's such a an advantage and a bonus to being an actor is to also get to, you know, really get a, an idea of another culture through your work. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, you know, that's truly amazing. You're getting to go around all these different places. And like you said, you're getting exposed to all these different cultures and you know, seeing what life is like in, in, in these, in these different places. You know, I can imagine, you know, that that's a really, you know, eye opening experience. Now, when you work with people and not just visit and you're not just talking to the concierge you're talking you know to the tour guide or something when you're actually living somewhere then you hear about people's lives and you understand how things work in that city you know and you get an idea of the local experience because then people ask you out or they ask you to your to their homes and stuff and and that's that's something you can't get as a tourist so i really feel fortunate for that my friends all over the world and have had experiences I wouldn't have had had I not been actually uh, living and working in different places. Yes, absolutely. So, so, so of course, you know, we've been talking about about the amazing acting career that that you've had and stuff. But, but now I want to get into the work you do with the Amanda Foundation, which is just absolutely wonderful. I read that it was founded in like like 1982. Uh, so, kind of when and how did you get involved? with the foundation, like how did that start for you? Well, I had moved to Los Angeles <clears throat> um, and was st had started Knott's Landing. And I brought with me my very, very ancient little Yorkshire Terrier. And her name was Theta Barra, who was the first movie star ever, Theta Barra. And I named my little dog after her. 
and she was quite elderly at the time. And I brought her to Los Angeles with me and she didn't live a whole lot longer. And, um, but when I, when I got to Los Angeles, I, um, you know, found a veterinarian and was taking her for checkups and visits and stuff. And the vet had an index card of with a um, push pin in a board saying, give to the, the dogs and cats at the Amanda Foundation, just written in pen. And I asked about it and they said, oh, there's some local women who've started charity. It's new and, you know, they need help. And I was working on this television show and, you know, you pay quite well when you do work. And uh, so I, every time I brought my little old dog in, I would get a check and say, you know, give this to the Amanda Foundation. And as I say, she passed away and I was brokenhearted. I was just devastated. And my veterinarian called me <clears throat> after a couple of weeks and he said, Terry, did you get yourself a new puppy? And I said, oh, Steve, I will never have another dog as long as I live. I said, I, I can't sleep. I can't eat. I've been crying. I get, I do my scenes. I come into my trailer. I cry. And then I put ice on my eyes so nobody can tell. And then I go back. But I said, I, I will never have And he said, well, you know that charity you've been giving the checks to? Um, I'm sure you could help them because you're on the television show. So, you know, that might make you feel better. Why don't you go over and visit them? I just walked in and I said, oh, I have a donation in memory of my dog. And the young lady said, oh, let me show you what we do. And I thought, I don't want to see what you do. (laughs) I get back in my car and go, oh, Christ. And um, she took me in the back. And in the kennels were all these dogs that had been rescued from the shelter. And then there were also cats as well. And... um, that was it. I, I never, I never, I started going and I never stopped. And over the years, I became more and more involved with the charity. And I realized that so many of the skills that I learned as an actress, I could help animals with because I've done, you know, I'm comfortable talking in crowds. I've been on stage. I, my voice can carry. I can go to the city hall and uh, speak for the animals because they cannot speak for themselves. And so I got more and more involved in advocacy and changing ordinances and helping create laws that were for the betterment of dogs and cats and all creatures in our urban uh, cities. Um, And uh, over the years, it became more important to me than what I was doing as an actress. And so I left that profession and continued growing um, as a I don't want to say activist. I think that sometimes conjures up someone who's confrontational, but I am a voice for the animals. And uh, the Amanda Foundation, everybody always asks me, they say, who's Amanda? Why is it the Amanda Foundation? Mm-hmm. Well, Amanda, the name in Latin, it means worthy of love. So our charity is named for our philosophy towards these animals who need us to protect them, is that they're worthy of our love. And uh, the Amanda Foundation rescues from uh, city and county shelters. Uh, we don't take animals from people because we feel that, you know, especially these days with social media, somebody can advocate for their own pet to find it at home. But the ones in the shelter do have a time limit on their, their life in the shelter. You know, they do euthanize in the shelters. So we concentrate on taking the ones that need us the most. And over the years, uh, we've gone from renting space at the veterinarians to owning the building and owning our own veterinary practice. And we're actually the only dog and cat rescue in all of California, not just the city of LA, that owns and operates a full service veterinary hospital. We do dentistry and surgery. And um, and in addition to that, we do have our adopted animals and we have a mobile clinic that goes to very underserved areas and provides free spay neuter because that's the most important thing. Well, 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 I have to say, you know, you know, it's it's really amazing getting to hear about the work that you're doing. Kind, kind of, kind of, kind of, just how you know everything got started and and stuff. And you know, it's really truly powerful to hear about. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, how did you, uh, how did you become, you know, the president of the you know foundation, and and just kind of what, just in general, what does it mean to you to be uh, leading such a great organization, you know, with a great mission. Well, thank you. I'll tell you about, I, it means a lot to me to be able to um, be at the forefront of Amanda because I've now been with Amanda for over 35 years. You know, I still continued acting when I first joined Amanda, but now it is what I do full time. And I have a lot of institutional knowledge, you know, and so 
I, can, I feel like I can do more now than I could 30 years ago because I know how things work, you know? And um, I worked with uh, Mayor Reardon at the time and the city, LA City Council to create uh, back in 2002, we created the strongest spay neuter ordinance in the entire country. And many ordinances around the United States have been based on the one that has been very successful here in Los Angeles. And I'm very proud to say that I worked on that. And I created the spay neuter mobile program by working with the city and saying, okay, so the animals in the shelter, what zip codes are they coming from? Where, where are all these animals coming from? Why are there so many? And then researching the neighborhoods and finding out they were all underserved neighborhoods that didn't have a veterinarian in them. And if they did it, the disposable income wasn't there to care for the pets. And these were nice people who loved their animals, but the care was just too expensive. So take free care and low cost care to those neighborhoods. You're not going to be able to afford to build a brick and mortar in all the different neighborhoods. But if you had a mobile clinic, you could go often enough to spay enough animals and vaccinate enough animals that you could change the amount of disease and the amount of unwanted litters. So I'm very proud of all of that and I'm happy and it's very fulfilling to know that we are making a difference. The Amanda Foundation has been the forefront of many ordinances, anti-tethering, anti-cruelty, breeding ordinances, backyard breeders, people who breed animals for profit and aren't breeding healthy animals and you know things like that. So we've been able to do a lot. So that's the the, the gravitas answer for you. But how did I become the president? Nobody wanted to be the president. <laughs> we were all volunteers. And we had, you know, because we were a nonprofit, you know, in order to, to be able to solicit donations and write grants, you have to have a nonprofit status. So we had that. And somebody has to be the president, the treasurer, and the secretary. But we were all volunteers. I was working full time, you know, uh, working on a television show 60 hours a week. And we were all, and we had a meeting. <laughs> it was like, Will you be president? No, you be president. Will you be president? <laughs> so it wasn't exactly a, a big lofty, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, coronation of being president. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but I have been doing it for a number of years, and um, and I I do love uh, being able to help. And at this point, like I say, um, there'll be somebody after me, and there's people within the Amanda Foundation that when you know um, uh, when I'm not here any longer will carry on. Uh, we're about to break ground next year on a new kennel and hospital, and that is a, a, a life's dream, is to create a, a building and an environment that's different from any other shelter you've been in, that it's based on creating a happy environment, not just a holding cell for uh, orphaned animals. I don't know, Sam, have you ever been to your local uh, dog shelter or cat shelter at all or ever had any experience with walking into a um whether it's a private charity or a city-owned facility like that have you ever had that experience uh, uh i i i i i don't think i have at least not that i can like, like recall at the moment well usually it's really sad you know there's a lot of animals that look unhappy or scared and it doesn't mean that the people in running the place aren't nice but usually shelters are done on a very low budget and they're made to fit as many animals in as possible and clean them as easy as possible. And they're, so it's very utilitarian and they tend to be echoey and, you know, it's hard. Sometimes they're very smelly and stuff. And so my goal with our new shelter is to create a really nice environment, not only for the animals that are living there um, so that it can be mentally and emotionally and physically healthy for them, but also that people don't dread going to these places. So they do go to shelters to adopt because we still have too many animals. You know, it's a supply and demand problem. You have too many animals and not enough homes. So you want to be able to entice people to say, don't go online and buy an animal. We've got millions in the shelter. We're euthanizing, we're still euthanizing millions. So, you know, if, if you have a good environment and the animals are happy and they behave and they're, um, when they meet people, they're happy. So then they're, they're going to make a good impression, you know, and uh, a lot of that has to do with with the where their what their environment is. So yeah, got big plans. I'm very excited, and you know, I look at Jane Goodall and I think, hey, I've got another twenty years. <laughs> so yeah, not that yeah. I'm comparing myself to her because she's done things all over the world and she's amazing and uh, my hero, but my hero. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, that's great to hear. It's amazing to hear uh, hear about that shelter that's going to be 
that's going to be coming up soon. It's really awesome to hear about kind of what, what's been the process like in term, terms of like kind of planning everything out for that. Like trying to learn, turn lead into gold. It's, it's, a, it goes on forever. I mean, there's, there's a great deal to do with planning a building. Um, and by the way, if anybody sees this and they have always wanted to put their name on a rescue hospital, you know, thing, please call me. You, know, you can reach me at amandafoundation.org. And uh, we're looking for people who may want a legacy gift to a to an animal hospital and shelter. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a big process because um, hospitals and kennels are complicated buildings. There's a lot of drainage and a lot of air filtration. It's not like building a house or an apartment. And hospitals per se are the most expensive buildings to build per square foot, you know? So there's a lot of technology, and nowadays there's a lot of technology that goes into a building like this. And also you wanna build a building that's environmentally as friendly as possible, you know, solar panels and different kinds of water heaters and you, how much water you're going to use, especially because we're in California and water is an issue, you know. So it's very complicated. Luckily, we have a phenomenal architectural firm called Animal Arts out of Colorado and Boulder, Colorado. I think they're the best in the country and they specialize in both shelters and hospitals. And uh, but it is a long process. And then because we're in California, we have to do seismic studies. We have to do seismic studies. Mm. Who knew? So so it's a long process. But we've come to the now we're ready to move forward and actually put a shovel in the ground. So I'm very excited. And hopefully two years from now, we might meet again. And I'll invite you to the ribbon cut. Oh, well, hey, I would love that. I would absolutely love to come by and see it whenever it opens because I, you know, I, I bet it's going to be amazing. So, yeah, yeah it is. and it's going to be amazing, not because it's fancy. It's going to be amazing because it's different and because it's a happy place and nobody's going to walk into our shelter and then say, oh, I like I've had people tell me, oh, I would like to adopt, but I can't bear some all those animals in cages and things like that. Well, there's a way to do it so that it's more like you know, visiting a nice resort than it is. And I, again, doesn't, I'm not talking fancy. I'm not talking marble floors. I'm just talking um, ways to plan the, the, the kennels so that they're not all facing each other. So the animals aren't all having anxiety, barking at one another and putting them on an angle and having uh, walkways between cages. So you're never walking one pet past 10 cages, you know, and stuff like that. There's lots of things. It's going to be, it's it's going to, I believe that our new shelter and hospital is going to be a watershed for shelters and hospitals. And I think we will be the, we will set the bar for what comes next in the next 20 years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, kind of set the standard for the future. Yeah, show it can be done. Yes, absolutely. And then then just kind of, you know, you know, you know other than the, you know, other, other than this, shelter and hospital that'll be opening up, you know, soon. What, you know, what other future goals do you have for the foundation? Well, one thing, you know, there is a shortage of uh, good support staff in both shelters and in ho and veterinary hospitals. And I'm talking about in, in the industry, you refer to these people as uh, veterinary technicians, but it's the equivalent of being a nurse. And in human medicine, you go to school for two years to become a registered nurse, an RN. And in veterinary medicine, you go for two years to become a registered vet technician, an RVT. And one of my, my fondest goals is to create a scholarship program and bring um, young people from underserved areas um, into our hospital to first work as assistants. And then if they show an aptitude and they're interested, then be able to scholarship them through our uh, hospital and learn have on the job training that they then can write their um, the exams to become a registered vet technician. It's a very good job and it's one you can do all over the country. You know, if you want to move somewhere, you decide you want to live in Montana, you can be a vet tech in, in Montana. And also, some vet techs go on to become doctors, uh, veterinary doctors of veterinary medicine, and we can always use more of those as well. So I'd really love to be a, a stepping stone for people who may not otherwise have that, um, that uh, career path suggested to them. Because if you don't grow up in a neighborhood where, first of all, maybe anybody in your family is a vet or a neighbor's not a vet or a vet tech, 
or there's not even a veterinary hospital in the area you grew up in, it may not occur to you that this is a great career and something if you love animals, you could actually have a career with something that you love. So that is another goal for the Amanda Foundation is to uh, become a, a, a career path for um, veterinary technicians and perhaps doctors as well. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 I, and I can tell you that, that I think you'll have the foundation under your leadership will have, will have no problem reaching and exceeding those goals. So. so right now we do a class called Creating Compassion. It's on our website. And we do this in um, the part of the city called Watts, um, which is an underserved area. And uh, what it is, is uh, it's an introduction to veterinary medicine for middle school kids. Again, just to expose them to what this career is. And most humane classes, if they even exist, and we have far too few of them in the country, but um, most humane classes consist of someone like myself going to a classroom and telling kids about, you know, don't put your, your, your dog's water dish in the sun and always use a leash. And, um, uh, you know, you should spay new to your pet. Here's a coloring book. Peace out. You know, and that's usually what most humane classes are like. And it's like one class. And what we have um, created with Creating Compassion is an entire semester of two hour classes once a month where it's an introduction to vet medicine. And other classes, we teach the kids about surgery. And we bring in surgical packs and we take the scalpels out because those are sharp and that's would be bad. But we leave all the other instruments in the pack and we teach the children what the instruments are and how to gown up for surgery and what an autoclave is and stuff. And I'm a big believer that if kids can touch stuff, you know, and they have a tactile um, experience, that it'll stick in their head. And so, uh, you know, that's my goal is to have hands on um experience for them in the classes another class is about we did this long before covid started and it's become just that much more relevant but we teach kids what's the difference between bacteria and and virus and what are vaccines and and we do this through teaching them how to make proper slides for uh, for the microscope not like you like i learned when i was in high school um, we teach them the way you would do it in a, in a professional lab so yeah i'm, I'm very high on the course it, it, it it's, a, it's really fun. The kids are sponges, are always fascinated. And uh, it's uh, it's fun for me, too. Gosh, that, you, you know, that's so awesome. You know, know that you're they're able to teach kids about this stuff. You know, I, th I think that's I think that's very important. You know, it's very beneficial, you know, and I, I, th I think that's awesome. You know, 11, 12 is a good age because they're very impressionable at that time, you know. And they're usually it's still at an age where their own pets are important to them. So when, when young people become teenagers, then other teenagers become the most important thing. So at that age, they're kind of it's a good age to to speak to them about pet responsibility and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And then for for anyone you know who might might be watching this, uh, for anyone who wants more information on the Amanda Foundation, uh, where can they go to find that information? We have a website. It's amandafoundation.org because we are a charity. So it's amandafoundation.org. And we also have a Facebook page and we have um, Instagram and we have TikTok and we have all of those things. I do not do those things. There are people younger than me who do all that stuff. But, uh, but we do have it. So if anybody's interested, there's always lots of um, video and pictures of critters. And then we do, you know, you can reach us by email as well. There's a contact us on the, on the website, whether, you know, if we were so lucky that someone wanted to contribute, but also sometimes people have questions. I get a lot of um, questions from people in other states asking about their uh, ordinances in the city and, you know, people who are concerned about stray cats in their neighborhood or people who are concerned that there, there aren't vaccine clinics. You know, a lot of the things that we take for granted in bigger cities are still very much an issue in rural parts of the United States. And, you know, especially with vaccination, even with rabies. So we, um, so we can, I consult a lot with people if they have questions that I, as I said, I've been around a long time. So there's things that I've learned. And if I can pass that on or help somebody um, give people some pointers on how to approach their local government about getting buy-in to help animals, you know, there's different budgets for different things. And whether you approach it from an educational point of view or a public safety point of view, or, you know, a, um, 
a uh, community service point of view, there's a lot of ways to get your city government to do things for animals that might not have occurred to you. I figured them out. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, well, 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 well hey, of course, anyone who wants any, any information, go to the website, go to all the links on social media, you know, because because Terry and the Amanda Foundation just doing amazing, am amazing work, work with these pets and making a positive impact, you know, in the lives of these pets too. Just again, Terry, just truly amazing work that you're doing. And I, and I have all the respect in the world for you. You're very kind. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Sam. Yes, absolutely. And just, of course, thank you so much for uh, letting me talk with you today. Just truly, truly, an, truly an honor. Like, 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 honestly, just uh, really an amazing experience as a fan of your work. Just uh, really awesome. So, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity. My pleasure. Yes, of course. Well, hey, you have an amazing rest of your day, Terry. Yeah. Just you too. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's, it's, there's very few days in Southern California that aren't beautiful. Here, just before you go, I'll just show you just, we have a lot of these in, in Los Angeles. We have a lot of Chihuahua mixes. So if anybody's looking for Chihuahua mixes, this is ground zero here. This is Lindsay. Lindsay's little tongue sticks out because she's older and she's missing a few teeth now. So. <laughs> oh, she is adorable. Thank you. Uh, well, well, hey Terry, you have uh, you have an amazing rest of your, rest of your day. Okay, enjoy the great weather. Ah, oh, I certainly will. You too.